Hey, how you doing? This is RJ. So welcome back to my weekday videos where I host stimulating conversations slash interviews with prominent individuals to talk about storytelling and culture. But before we get to the interview, I just want to remind everyone that the campaign for my new graphic novel, The Valiant Heroes, is still up. You can also order my first graphic novel, Thomas Valiant, from that campaign if you wish as well. You're looking at some of the spectacular art from both of those books in the background. And the early bird sign-up page for my next graphic novel, Crom the Destroyer, is now up. You can sign up there so that when the campaign opens in about six months, you will be informed. And if you do so, you also get a free exclusive pinup poster when you purchase something from the campaign. Once again, you're looking at some of the spectacular art from Crom the Destroyer in the background from my artists, Jim O'Reilly and Mike Gustavich. As usual with all of my content, each of these stories center around my exploration of the traditional hero. Thomas Valiant and the Valiant Heroes are superhero stories, 82-page giants. Crom the Destroyer is a sword and sorcery graphic novel centered around death and honor. So if any of that looks or sounds appealing to you at all, you might want to click on that link or both of those links in the description and go on over and see if any of my graphic novels are for you. All right, on with the interview. All right, welcome back to my weekday videos where I do interviews and conversations with prominent individuals about storytelling and culture. And today I have with me Connor Tomlinson, who many of you may recognize from the Lotus Eaters, but has done a considerable amount besides. So Connor, if you would like to tell my audience a little bit about yourself, just in case they don't know who you are. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you for having me on, RJ. Uh, I am Connor. I am a writer and host at lotuseaters.com, little enterprise set up by the notorious Carl Benjamin, former Sargon of Akkad. And one of the main series we do over here actually is between myself and my co-host Harry, which is Comics Corner, which once a month we take a deep dive into the world of graphic novels, comic books, and some of their adaptations, talk about storytelling, some of the underlying ethics of the stories, which maybe the um, creators didn't always intend. For example, we looked at M. Night Shyamalan's Unbreakable Split and Glass trilogy and decided it was Decidedly conservative in execution, which he didn't obviously set out to put it that way. So we have a, a good time discussing that over there. Before I worked at Lotus Eaters, I was a freelance columnist for the American Spectator and a few climate policy magazines trying to roll back a lot of the government overreach on things like net zero. But one of the main things I looked at American Spectator was analysing film and media from a decidedly non-progressive bent. And the first article I actually did for them was analysing the John Kent Superman sexuality swap. So I've really cut my teeth in this sort of culture and media analysis realm. Um, I've really enjoyed doing it, mainly because one of my first forays into politics was back in 2014, back when lots of people were going, get the feminists out of our video games, while I was going, get the race activists out of my comics, because one of the most beloved characters I had of all time was Wally West, particularly from the Young Justice cartoon, though as I grew up reading Wolfman and Perez's obviously well-celebrated new Teen Titans run, I found out I identified with Wally a hell of a lot because he had girl trouble and was instinctively conservative, so what a guy. And when they turned him into Wallace West, just to make him hip, young, and African-American, I nearly threw my new 52 copies across the room, and I didn't quite understand why this was being waged, this weird war on all the things I held dear, but now... Nearly 10 years on, I think we've got a pretty good understanding of why the culture is so interested in us, even if some of us aren't necessarily as interested in it anymore. So I'm going to ask you my normal question. I ask all of my interviewees, and it is to get a sense of where you are just personally in looking at stories. So what is your favorite story? And it can be from any genre you want. Ooh, this is a really difficult question. I know you always ask this at the top of your interviews, and I probably should have prepared for it, but I'll go for comics and books separately. Uh, Books-wise, I've always loved things like Great Gatsby and Catcher in the Rye. I've always liked quite deep character studies. And even though I appreciate the forthrightness of heroism in something like Steve Ditko's early Spider-Man work or a lot of the old, like John Byrne Superman style stuff of where the, the moral forthrightness of the hero is always quite clear. I do like the tortured mid-20th century uh, American 
character studies because you can extrapolate a lot from the indecisiveness and, and tragic errors of the male characters exactly what not to do. And also the language is always really nice. As far as comics go, some of my favourites include the original Lean... Uh, Len Wein and Bernie Wrights and Ronald Swamp Thing, because I, I just love the art and the, the flowery language of the storytelling style and the pathos that drips through with, with Swamp Thing's character. But my first one is actually one of my favourites, and that is Batman Hush. So when I was about five, the Hush storyline was being released in monthly issues, and I got, I think it was 612 and 613, which was The Return of Jason Todd. Those were my first two issues of comics ever. And my first introduction to Batman was, oh, he's a dad that's lost a son. And from that jumping on point, I, I understood his character almost inside out within that context. And so he became a, a very compelling character to me. So I always quite enjoy the focus on the the internal monologues of the characters and their interpersonal drama and their ability to overcome very personal issues to them, which is one of the sources of frustration for modern storytelling for me, because I'm sure as we'll parcel out as the discussion continues, rather than virtues and actions and pathos, we have identity characteristics being exalted as the one thing to aspire to, and if only that pesky civilization, which is so intolerant, would get out of the way and stop being villains, then these people could be their true authentic selves and be the true heroes among us. And, and that sanitizing of storytelling with any actual moral weight is both a great shame for the art form and an insidious crime which implicates any of us that don't hold those identity characteristics as the true villains in society. So you are probably the youngest person I've had on interviews so far because you're a millennial and uh, you look well, at I'm things actually a little Z, bit different. Well, uh, if, you're, if you're saying um, Batman 617, that's around 2003, I think, when you got into comics. So, so your entry into yeah. this would be through everything from you know 2000 forward so it's very interesting to to hear a dynamic from someone who hasn't looked at those books from coming off of the shelf or the spinner rack but going back to look at great stories which i think is what you do when you look at those comics um when you go back to older comics within those videos you just talked about but i want to touch on something that you just said there and the fact that with this entry of things like identity politics into our stories. Now, I just talked with uh, John C. Wright last week or two weeks ago, and he was talking about how comics were the purest form of mythology that we have right now. And I find it funny because not only did he mention that, but when I did one of my first videos for my channel, I did something, um, an interview with Sana Aminat, who was a person really, I think, in operational control of Marvel from about 2009 to 2020. And she talked also about comics as mythology. But the mythology that she's talking about is the entry of this kind of identity politics into these myth-like stories. So do you see, I know that you also have a, um, a degree in, in English from University of Kent, if I do believe, but do you see this kind of playing out of mythology, not only within the stories, but within this new kind of political correctness and within the new myth of, of the left? Absolutely. One of the dissertations I actually did during my four years at, at Kent was looking at superhero comics as the American monomyth and played out in the political context of the Cold War, because cultural exports are uh, not only a reflection of the stories we tell ourselves, but particularly in the commercial way that comics are sold. America used its media and its superhero comics to export their values around the world. This is why you were always battling everything from the Axis powers in the 1940s to communists right through the 50s to 70s until it became very unpopular to oppose those ideas. Um, the interesting thing about the co-opting of superhero comics by the progressives is that they obviously acknowledge the power that this has, particularly with its younger audience demographic, um, which was originally obviously the, the target of sanitization by the likes of Frederick Wortham and Saddam of the innocent, but now they're deliberately trying to pervert the minds of children with these with these art forms. Um, the tacit admission in there that it is a source of power is why we shouldn't really dismiss it. So I, I've had in the past when we've put our preview clips up for Comics Corner on the second channel over at Lotus Ears, some people who think, you know, I'm, I'm very enmeshed in politics and philosophy. What's the point of wasting time talking about what is equivalently children's stories? It's the same thing that people get for criticizing Star Wars. Why do you care about the movie that's about space wizards intended for children? Well, one, 
if it is intended for children, then we should fill children's heads with things that are wholesome and not awful, like the progressives are trying to do. But, but two, the fact that they're interested in it means it has power. And so we shouldn't cede that ground to them. Now, as far as the American monomyth idea goes, um, I see comics very much as the sort of secular fulfillment of what John Winthrop said in his sermon um, on Christian charity, which is that America sees itself as the shining city on a hill, it, as the new form of Jerusalem, uh, Jerusalem, the rational reconstruction of the biblical ethos outside of the denominational infighting of the church that was in England at the time over from Rome and, and across the European continent. So the idea that America is fulfilling its values and then exporting those values around the world is kind of imbued in comics, especially since one of its germinating things was the Second World War. Again, another massive story that America tells itself of. We intervened in the Second World War because we wanted to spread democracy around the world and defeat the evils of the Nazis and the like. And so that story is quite a powerful jumping off point for saying, okay, if we pass these characters down the great chain of civilization of artists, writers, and all of that across the 20th century, then it's kind of a dialectical process for working out how Americans see themselves, what American values are, and how do we disseminate them out into the world. And so you've got those generations of, of iterating on the ideals of the hero. But something that's, that's really interesting with comics as well is that because you have to take the property and, and run with it. There is something core and immutable about each of those characters, each of the cities they live in, each of the villains that they face. And so, and especially because you keep inventing new villains to represent the new problems of the age or these, these new moral quandaries that these heroes can be tested with, you have to, as a good writer, take the core essence of a character, extrapolate it, play it out to its logical conclusion, and put it in a bunch of different scenarios, but always come back to the core morality that, that the original creator imbued within that character. And by testing that out in different testing grounds and different scenarios versus different villains over time, we come to understand the kinds of, of ethics that we should play out in the world and also to avoid sort of moral pitfalls. It's the idea that um, tragedy, for example, has the case so that bad ideas die so that you don't have to. Well, with superhero comics, we are playing that out in different contexts over generations and all sorts of good artists and writers were able to do that. Now, the sad thing about the perversion of the American monomyth is that, one, um, America's not so great on the world stage anymore, and coinciding with that, you have this self-criticism that's done not from a constructive angle, which you could do from like the libertarian right in the States, for example, that say we shouldn't be engaging in all these foreign wars overseas, we should be America first, and we should we should go back to our founding principles. Instead, intersectionality has crept in and has used the promise of equality within the American Constitution to undermine your faith in yourselves, take all of your stories, parasitize them, and make you so nihilistic and doubtful about the moral legitimacy of the American project that the Cold War engaged in spreading around the world, so that while you're busy questioning yourselves, they can come and colonize it with their identity socialism, which just so happens to appoint them as the dictatorship of the black gay, queer, disabled, whatever, proletariat. And so this is why we shouldn't allow the, the great American monomyth to fall to the left as it has done. This is why yourself, Eric July, Chuck Dixon, all the folks that are doing things like Comicsgate or even people that hopefully aspire to recapture these institutions like DC and Marvel before they inevitably go under because they're so unprofitable in the future. Um, this is why we shouldn't cede ground. This is why we should reclaim the great stories of the past and keep telling good stories out into the future because clearly it's a really useful utility for talking about how we view ourselves and how we should act. So you brought up something about the fact that it's an American monomyth. Do you see this in only an American way? Because I know there are Scandinavian, there's a, there's a lot of um, Scandinavian comics and concentration on the comics in Scandinavian countries, but they take a decidedly left-hand view of a lot of things. They I've read um, dissertations about um, the Shadow and uh, the Phantom, older pulp heroes like that. And of course, um, France has its own kinds of comics with its own format, and they concentrate on a lot of American ideas, but older American ideas like Westerns and things like that, trying to harken back to things that America has, I suppose, left by the wayside at this point. So you see this as, if I'm um, reading you correctly, um, a distinctly American thing with distinct American qualities within the American comic industry, as opposed to all of the rest within Europe and even around the world. Is that correct? Yeah, I think Bond Desene and, and manga actually have the ability to traverse different genres. But you have, and we've spoken about this in an upcoming episode of Comics Corner with Harry about Berserk. Um, the manga industry has different 
uh, avenues it can go down, whether it's fantasy, whether it's superhero, like My Hero Academia or One Punch Man. But you have genre commonalities in the form. So they'll make the same faces, they'll make the same hyper-exaggerated expressions. You can tell that it is from Japan. But American superhero comics, even though they have formal deviations, have this sort of core immutability and a tone about them that that you you know it is Americana, right? There's there's a reason that Uncle Sam is a is a DC hero. There's a reason that that Wonder Woman and Superman wear the wear the colors of the red, white, and blue. It, it's the Americanism is inextricable from how the superheroes were formed, and so the perversion of it. I think this is also why, as well, you see the the change of the art style to become a lot more degraded with this new weird Tumblr-ish Californian art style pervading everything and that stuff that just isn't selling. Um, the California politics and the Californian art style come from the same place, and they, they come out of the same rotten hole, and that's what's infected the whole of the comics industry. So I think the American comics is very much apart from the European and the Japanese comics, and I also think that's why um, American comics have had uniquely poor sales in recent years, whereas during COVID, the French comics saw a massive boom, and manga, I mean, what was it? Chainsaw Man or... or Demon Slayer, in one year outsold the entire American comics market, and I think the the values that haven't necessarily been perverted over there are why those are insulated as pure forms of entertainment, whereas the progressives have realized that as an American cultural product that can be exported overseas and can be used to wield influence, that comics is a useful thing to capture, and that's why it and video games were the first front lines back in 2014 in the culture war, which has now expanded up to the level of the presidency. So... When you talk about comics, there seems to be a bit of a divide because I would say from watching what I have seen you do, you're much more of a DC fan and you talk about um, the mythology mm. of comics in a DC way, but the kind of stories that you seem attracted to are more of a grounded, gritty Marvel kind of character development story. So just personally, when you're thinking about these things that we're talking about, um, what kinds of, of heroes would you be concentrating on? Would you would you be um, almost exclusively a DC fan? Or um, am I mistaken on that? You're not mistaken. I, I, I'd lean much more towards it. I mean, I, I enjoy things like Daredevil. Um, the Frank Miller Daredevil run is undisputedly fantastic. But if anyone has seen my shelves, and there is a photo in episode four of Comics Corner, I have a certain unique set of DC hardbacks only sold in the UK that all line up to the members of the Justice League and the JSA. And and you had to buy each one over the course of years. And I'm, I'm very particular about that. And I've always just been drawn to DC. I think my, my late uncle, who was a wonderful guy, was a Marvel fan. And he used to buy me X-Men Fantastic Four floppies. And I think he would be uh, gutted where he stood around today to know that those all fell by the wayside. But but yeah, no, I, I am interested in the dichotomy that... that Someone else phrased it like this, I can't remember who it was, but Marvel is um, human beings trying to become gods, and DC is gods trying to become human beings. And I I find that quite interesting, Of the, the because Marvel, I understand, has a lot of interpersonal drama, but DC as well, they not only have solid characterization, but they also deal with wider moral quandaries. This is why something like Identity Crisis and Cry for Justice, how Harry and I have tried to salvage from modern criticism, because a lot of scorn gets poured on it. But no, it is interesting in the interplay of these grand powers, these people that, that smash their fists together and, and topple skyscrapers. Okay, how does that apply to our considerations of how justice is dealt and, and retribution and... and, and vigilantism and, and so i i've always found dc i've been drawn more to it um the kinds of characters i've dealt with though again i enjoy batman very much i've always really enjoyed the the swamp thing runs i've enjoyed martian manhunter who has always been overlooked as kind of a side character and i love his comedic inputs in justice league international but i wish we'd gotten a lot more of the kind of thing that darwin cook did in new frontier of of where he has serious identity issues of trying to fit in because he's very much a man of of good character but visually he is always set apart from people so yeah i've i've always found myself drawn more towards dc just incidentally but also i i think they've got a, they've got a lot of good stuff there particularly from the 80s and i think dc in the 80s was also unapologetically conservative 
in many bents. I'm not sure how conservative Reagan actually was on policy, but it's interesting that like Blue Beetle was reading National Review and Superman was was the Republican president's confidant and and DC's legends as well. It's really unfortunate that in recent years um, John Ostrander has become a raving leftist. But way back when, Legends ends with a quote from Ephesians 6, which is the, we struggle not against peoples, but principalities and dark powers in the world. So it's got an explicitly biblical bent. And the entire point of it is the dark forces of Apocalypse behind the scenes are manipulating the media to make people hate the excellence of heroism and blame all inequality on these excellent people. And he, with French revolutionary rhetoric, marches up to the Lincoln Memorial saying, we're going to tear down the White House and build something anew from the ashes. And that gets utterly trounced because the kids believe in heroism. And, and it, okay, could you get a more conservative narrative than that way back when? There are seeds in Crisis on Infinite Earths that deliberately try to even just formally, you know, bring things into a streamlined continuity and, and make history make sense. But there are lots of little conservative plot points in there about the renunciation of the oppression of the USSR. And and so it's a shame that, that comics have really fallen by the wayside, and particularly DC as well, with DC Pride coming up. I don't know if you've seen that stuff, but trying to make an alternative universe of Hal Jordan gay, so he definitely is in love with Barry Allen. And sexualizing Nightwing to have on a front cover him doing squats while while bisexual Tim Drake takes a selfie. This this version is just really depressing to me because I can see that DC has had some great stories and has transmitted some really solid values across time. So one thing I think that you would be uniquely qualified in talking about is since you're talking about, again, all of this as a American monomyth, where do you see the great storytellers and artists of uh, English origin coming into the American comic industry and bringing new ideas, new kinds of storytelling. Because I know um, I struggled when I was, you know, going through comics a long time ago to get um, the Captain Britain uh, runs, you know, and all those kinds of things you have in DC. There's Vertigo, um, and again, you have Swamp Thing, which I think those runs you're talking about are are Alan Moore. All of that. Um, English sensibility that was brought in from the late 70s and through the 80s and 90s, where does that play into the change within comics and the way they viewed themselves over those three decades, really? Okay, so I have been known on Lotus Eaters for my occasional contentious opinion, and I won't hold back here. I think they fit into it by partially ruining it. And I... So if you look at the, the dynamic between um, Watchmen and The Dark Knight Returns, for example, which we're going to... Harry covered Watchmen on Lotus Eaters long before I got here, but we're going to go over some ground in future when we talk about Doomsday Clock and Rebirth. Because I think that also represents the the purgatory cycle of reboots and redefinitions that you have had since Watchmen at DC Comics. And and you have the, the ethic of Jeff Johns versus the ethic of Alan Moore is probably a good way to put it. And and so Jeff Johns is a very much a, a Silver Age reclaimist. Um, that goes really wrong when you try and apply it to movies, it turns out, because he bastardized Justice League. But it actually goes quite well when it comes to uh, things like Infinite Crisis and, and Green Lantern Rebirth, because he understands the essence of the character and there is a an optimistic trajectory to their ability to overcome great evil, even if the stakes continually increase. And he also has a lot of reverence for what came before. Alan Moore, being an awful commie, is a deconstructionist. And I think Watchmen is a... I, I, I like how Grant Morrison once insulted it. And it's a, it's just a shame that Grant Morrison's become a parody of himself. But um, he called it the, the equivalent of a sick form essay. And... It, it really does come off that way because it's got a a lot of polish and under examination very little depth and it's a, a work of accidental genius because Alan Moore didn't intend for Rorschach to be the hero he intended obviously to satirize Steve Ditko and objectivism but Rorschach is the only one that comes out of it looking good um, Alan Moore actually wanted a sort of utilitarian end to the Cold War because he was so afraid of nuclear warfare that he exalted Ozymandias and I think trying to drag everything down to that level of moral subjectivism and instead, um, kind of eradicating heroism as you go along, and that text being held up as the industry standard of quality has made the entire industry kind of dour and locked in this cycle of abusing its heroes over and over for shock value and having to forcibly resurrect it as the next thing gets passed on. And so it feels like we're in this weird, sad dialectic of the creators that actually care for quite a while, for a couple of decades, were having to rescue from the forces of entropy in trying to ape Watchmen, 
all the stuff that they grew up on and loved before, like Jeff Johns. And now, because of editorial pressures and the overwhelming amount of intersectional ideologues that have staffed these institutions, not just at the creative level, but even in things like AT&T and Warner Brothers who are funding it, lots of those guys have either burned out, like Johns did, or just aren't being hired anymore. And so what you get instead is this endless cycle of of progressive reboots and revisionism and a totally devoid moral center. And part of the reason that totally devoid moral center is there is because they want to be the moral center. They want to be legislators. They want just constant affirmation that they are good enough. And and that is a, as someone said, I believe on your show before, it's a deeply narcissistic thing. And it's unsurprising that lots of the sort of foundations of intersectionality, being uh, Nietzsche, Marx, and the like, wanted to, as Marx once said, revolve around themselves as their own true son. It is the always the project of putting the self at the centre, and because you don't have to do anything to warrant that praise, the, the virtue of the hero gets pulled out, and instead it just becomes, okay, how can the entire narrative validate my worldview and my identity, and anything that doesn't validate it is immediately the villain. It's very interesting um, that you connect rebooting with um, the taking of a hero and drawing out the really good qualities of it, because um, you have talked, uh, I think, at length uh, about um, The Dark Knight Returns. And that would be, in part, I would say, inspired by Alan Moore and what he had done with Watchmen. They wanted to make Batman much more um, gritty and um, something that was not the traditional form of Batman, whereas it became really the touchstone for what Batman was after that point. It, it was a much darker Batman. It was a much more, um, I don't know, villainous, even in some sense, Batman as compared to what had come before. And I know Batman is one of your favorite heroes, but you talk about sometimes about um, uh, Frank Miller and um, Dark Knight Returns in much of a positive light. I see it in a positive light as a creative endeavor, but not as in the legacy to which it has left us because it has taken Batman and it has incorporated into him a darkness that wasn't there before. I would say before he was a light in the darkness and he was someone who went out into the dark, but was always that light in the darkness for, for a lot of people. And that was the heroic origin and really mainstay of the character what do you think of that dynamic and, and how it has played out with, again, one of your favorite characters? Okay, so, again, I'm not going to shy away from some contentiousness. I will just correct. I do believe that Dark Knight Returns was, was in production and released before Watchmen because I think it was the second ever graphic novel format. The first one was World of Krypton in like 1979. So I think Dark Knight Returns actually came out before Watchmen did. They just released in the same year. Um, but... I would say that The Dark Knight Returns has actually had a positive impact on the legacy of Batman and reforming him from the campy 60s stuff when nobody took it seriously because he was neutered ultimately by Frederick Wortham because Wortham accused Batman of being a homosexual pedophile with Robin and then the progressives in this day and age thought, I like that idea, why don't we just make Robin gay and this isn't going to look awful at all. But anyway, point being, I, I think that Frank understood Batman's sort of not Dionysian spirit, because that's what other people say. The the sort of uber libertarianism about Batman that that was demonized in by Mark Wade in Kingdom Come, um, when he outsources Gotham as an ANCAP utopia to robots which police only rights violations. So even though Batman's meant to be the villain in that, in many respects, he he definitely isn't. Uh, but I I think Miller executes very well on Batman's morality. He, what Miller has done though is he's become an acid on Superman. And I don't know how intentional that was long term. I, I do know that Miller seems to conceive of Batman as quite a deeply resentful person because he said, the reason I made Superman the villain of Dark Knight Returns was because Batman would hate Superman not only because he has it all together, but this is the guy who could fly when I needed a goddamn car. And that seems like a petulant characterization of Batman that, that isn't quite true. But with Superman, Miller has conceived of Superman as someone who is a loyalist to power and someone who is a big blue boy scout, not in the way that he has a wholesome American ethic, but that he's very much by the book and, and goes by the rules. And now we are trapped in that post-Dark Age paradigm with Superman specifically, which is that 
the most popular incarnations of Superman recently have been, obviously, he's going to be an inevitable fascist. And there are two things with that. Um, number one, it's a great shame that we don't have some kind of strong moral character from Superman because he is a great reference point for things like fatherhood, as we saw in the unfortunately brief rebirth run, which then was absconded in favor of Brian Michael Bendis. And now we're locked in this cycle of, okay, Grant Morrison had to rescue Superman from becoming a fascist with Superman and the authority, but then he's teaming up with the authority, which he was meant to be satirizing with Superman 775. And we've got Injustice, and we've got Homelander as the sort of cultural touchstones for, for Superman. But then the other thing is, I think the reason we can't rescue it is because, back to the idea of American superhero comics being a reflection of how America thinks of itself, nobody's really that willing to stand up for American values anymore. Um, this is a great video you did actually quite a long while ago now about truth, justice, and the American way. I think after 9-11, the synonymousness of, of America with sort of self-doubt and the fact that it, it did some imperial actions on the world stage, and that both the libertarian right and the intersectional left that never liked it in the first place found a wedge issue to criticize it on those grounds it means that it has been quite difficult in media to for quite a while parcel out what american values are from what america is doing at the moment and now again the institutions aren't staffed by anyone who has a positive word to say about america and so ground has been ceded for the heroes which best represent american values unapologetically to either disregard or deconstruct them entirely and that's why i think we had to we, we seen we didn't have to but we have seen them disregard the original clark kent superman almost allow him to languish in a fascistic state culturally it's speaking at least if not him being in canon at the moment because i know he's just come back from war world and instead have his bisexual son take over who has a boyfriend who idolizes the latest incarnation of Lois Lane, who is now almost a complete career woman because she and Clark nearly had a divorce, and her most recent series written by Greg Rucko had her literally shouting at Sarah Huckabee Sanders uh, at the press conference uh, for the Trump administration. So all of these things are, are imbued with self-criticism of American values, American uh, America's presence on the world stage, and it plays whack-a-mole with any attempt to try to resurface a kind of American patriotism that says, no, compared to a lot of other nations on Earth, we do actually have a noble project, which, if we haven't always lived up to it, it's good on paper. So speaking of what you had just referenced, my old video about truth, justice in the American way, I did it because I ran across, um, I think it was Superman Smashes the Klan, uh, done by, I think it was Greg... Yoon, I'm not entirely sure his name off the top of my head, but he basically um, did a Twitter thread where he talked about um, either you're for tolerance, which should replace the American way and how he defines tolerance is what the left is, the progressive left is, that's how he defines tolerance, or you're for blood and soil, which is an old Nazi term. So this is exactly what he's trying to do. He's saying you're either progressive or you're a Nazi. And this is what a lot of people, when they go back, I get a lot of comments on that old video about Superman smashes the Klan. They don't quite get the nuance of the fact that this is what is being said. And it's a line right down the middle of either you're on our side or you're completely evil. And that's something which I think is missing within the conversation everyone is having around comics because older comics everyone is trying to say no it was always this way no it was always that way i would say no it was a medium wherein as you said having um an american um monomyth there was an ability for both sides to exist at the same time where they could have a discussion and parse out what exactly was going on within this story and possibly fall on one side or the other depending on who you are and what your ideas about existence are. That is what is missing within modern comics and the discussion around modern comics, if you ask me. There is no ability to, to allow for someone to say, yes, you're right on this point, but let's explore where it is wrong. It's either you're completely wrong or you're completely right. Do you see that within not just the books themselves, but also the analysis around comics, part of which is what you're doing? So I, I think it's important here to highlight the fact that, and I don't think Gene Jung, I think his name's Gene Jung, um, knows of this concept, perhaps, but he definitely is playing it out. When he says tolerance, he really means Herbert Marcuse's concept of repressive tolerance, which means that, okay, leftism is on an inexorable arc of social justice, as MLK 
would say and once plagiarized and so because we're inevitably progressing towards utopia the good progressive's job is to steward that arc and expedite it as quickly as possible so that the most amount of people get to see utopia in our lifetime and so anyone standing in that way because we've predefined ourselves as as correct uh, as Karl Marx would do with the dialectic of historical materialism he believed that he had a totalizing theory of history that went from feudalism to capitalism to socialism to communism and because he predefined that arc as happening therefore any action by the revolutionary proletariat against bourgeoisie was justified up to and including murder um because that's the case that anyone that's arguing against that is not a a principled piece of opposition is not suggesting a different way of getting to utopia no instead they are speed bumps over which we should drive as fast as possible because otherwise we will never get there and so with repressive tolerance it just equates to the old the old way that Mark Hughes formulated it as we tolerate all movements which progress us to the left and are intolerant towards any movements which hold us back from the right. So it's just a tribal signifier. It's the old Carl Schmitt distinction of friend and enemy. And what they're doing by playing the friend-enemy distinction in the progressive paradigm is they're saying, okay, we've predefined ourselves, our identities, as marginalized because we've been born into this world of institutional oppression and we're institutionally oppressed because we don't have all the power and all that matters is power there is no truth but power so we need the power in order to create the truth that is the new utopia okay so what we do is we tell stories about ourselves this is what charles r lawrence the third called for in the word and the river that we need to flood the airways with our stories so we can create a consensus which then justifies in the eyes of the powerful us rising up and taking some of that power for ourselves so what we do is we create characters which represent only us and that is our intersectional identity marker our race, our sex, our sexuality, our disability, our religion, all these infinitely fractioning things that are turtles all the way down but always create new grievance constituencies to tear the society asunder. And we say, okay, by virtue of them having an oppressed identity, they are struggling. So their struggle is the heroic struggle. This is why the... Um, uh, Tom Taylor, you said in your video, with the quote he had was that he's a young bi guy and that's really empowering. Okay, by virtue of, of Jonathan Kent being bisexual and the entirety of society being intolerant, he is having the chains of civilization put upon him, and breaking those chains is the heroic act. So rather than actually having actions which are virtuous, having having values which are virtuous that shine through, no, they were they were predefined as virtuous by the sake of their identity. And it's only that the society isn't letting them to be their authentic selves. That's the only reason that they aren't being fully celebrated, as you see in, in DC's Pride, where they have literal super pride floats going down the street. So the the innate implication in that narrative is is one, civilization is what's standing in the way of utopia. So it's it's a heroic act to destroy it all and rebuild anew. And two, uh, if you aren't the identity which is being celebrated, you are automatically implicated as the villain. And so that basically means that straight white men are indistinguishable from Lex Luthor. And considering Superman exercises a lot more restraint than the progressives would, were they given Superman's power, I dread to think what their empowerment fantasies, um, how far they would go, were they being honest about it. So far, they've only thrown most of the villains in prison, but I remember there was a podcast from Marvel that you analysed quite a while ago, saying that they all identified more with the villains than the heroes, and when people tell you who they are, I think we should believe them and be very sceptical about the professed benevolence of their progressive motivations. It's interesting that you bring it back to a Mercusian um way of understanding, because I would also compare that with, um, again, uh, I think Horkheimer, um, and going back to a almost Hegelian dialectic, where they're basically saying that um, you paste, you place history behind a, a barrier of the unrepeatable, wherein it's past, it will never come back, and you can never look back to it. Anyone who does look backwards to it is just engaging in a futile act, and therefore we must always be driven forward, which, again, I would say uh, these are um, critical theorists, so I, I would put uh, Marcuse in there with them as well, at the very least um, in the intellectual strain. So I can see that as an origin point and uh, very much coming out within the stories and then connect that with something, as you said, with um, the new Superman who is um, basically written by Tom Taylor, as he said, without any kind of conflict in the books. That was his entire intent, not to put conflict within the books. That is to say, there's not a villain that you're going to punch. It's going to be an explanation of how this person is virtuous simply by showing, I guess it would be, again, uh, a more of a Hegelian dialectic, as in this is where we're moving forward towards. These are the 
two ideas that are dovetailing in order to make this new kind of hero. So Tom Taylor would be with his his um, bisexual Superman defining a new type of hero rather than giving you heroes that show themselves heroes by action. So is that part of what you're trying to say when you're discussing this in a Marcusean way? Absolutely. And and I wanted to bring it back to the point that you made earlier that sent me on this tangent, which was, yeah, quite a few years ago, you would even if you had liberal writers like Denny O'Neill, who I greatly respect, despite disagreeing with probably all of his politics, he at least had the good sense to not insult the reader by having a debate play out. Now, I think the Green Lantern and Green Arrow comics are terrible in terms of the writing. I, I, I think they're just, you know, the, the issues that they present, they're, they're more one-stop shop think pieces than they are proper character development and you get a bit issuey of the week but at least he had the due diligence to put up a more conservative character like Hal Jordan with a more liberal character bordering on socialist with Oliver Queen and have a bit of a, a back and forth because in the first issue Ollie gets one over on Hal with the most annoying sort of treatise by introducing him to the, the black tenant that says oh you you do things for the the purple skins and the yellow skins and the orange skins, but you never do things for black folks. And for some reason, this is a major own to Green Lantern, who has to look after an entire universe and suddenly has to care about one tenement building that's being run by one corrupt landlord that he didn't even know about until he set foot in the place. But but fine, whatever. But in the other issues, it does actually highlight how how Ollie's worldview is somewhat limited because he can't just shoot a boxing glove arrow at everything to fix it. And so at least Denny O'Neill, despite his politics, had the due diligence to not insult the intelligence of the audience. Now these people see themselves as the the new priestly class, the kind of tea leaf re, uh, tea leaf readers of systemic racism, the doctrinal interpreters of what has already been predefined as correct, and you silly plebs just don't understand how great my intersectional theory is, which always happens to result in my empowerment, my enrichment, and me ruling over your lives. And so I just have to sit there and explain to you, rather than play it out in a conflict, because we've already had the conflict, it's over, you know, history is already on this inexorable path, we don't need more conflict, just shut up and take it. I have to sit there and explain to you through an autobiographical account of this new bisexual Superman who's going on school climate strikes rather than, you know, flying up to the ice caps and freezing it with his frost breath or whatever. I have to make you understand why this is an archetype you must follow. And this is links back to a really important point you've made in the past, which is that the fact that they're sinking money into this, the fact that it's not profitable, the fact that they're taking government grants just to keep the wheel spinning with, you know, Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur, means that they are insistent on this being the new ethic, they want to homogenize the ethic across all of the publishing line, and it doesn't matter if individual comics get cancelled, like Snowflake and Safe Space, or the Tim Drake series that just got axed, or Batgirls, where they were marching against police brutality. It doesn't matter if one or two titles get cancelled and dropped there. They are cannon fodder in the grand progressive project of advancing us towards historicist justice. So we can lose a few quid, because in the ideological utopia, we'll all have plenty, and there'll be no offense left. So I wanted to go back just one of the things that you had pulled on and um, talk about Wally West for one second. Mm. And that is one of your favorite heroes. You just uh, talked about mm. Wally. But again, within this um, American project, this American monomyth, um, the reason why I wanted to talk about it is because that was the first book I can remember where they replaced an old hero with a new hero, took the junior member and made him into the actual Flash. And um, mm. that may not have been the case, but as a comic reader, when that was coming out, that was something exciting and new at that time. So it was taking an older hero with older ideas and being expressed in an older way towards that generation and then revamping it to a newer generation with newer ideas and newer heroes. Um, basically, just because Wally was a different kind of Flash, um, his powers didn't work exactly the same and all that kinds of things. I find it very funny that we get into today and within the last 10 years where they're trying to take this character and destroy him and bring back the original character. And I'm not entirely sure why DC is trying again and again to do this, because again, this would be really uh, in the storylines. Anyways, much more conservative character than Wally West ever was. And at the very, I mean, Wally still a conservative character, but not as much as uh, the old Flash with the old stories. But the progressives, again, are trying to destroy these heroes that have brought us up and again, had made us into who we are, I guess, in North America and defined who we are by reflection, not by 
example. And yet they're trying to tear this down and replace it with older ideas, which they can then redefine. And that redefinition of language, again, is something we see redefinition of hero as well, as we just talked about with uh, Tom Taylor, redefining what it means to be a hero, redefining what it means to be Superman. But what other characters and in, in what other ways do you see this redefinition being taken and put into heroic stories to try to teach rather than to um, to give a reflective example of of what needs to be done or or what a heroic person is. I don't know if that's a that's a big old long uh, I guess windy twisty uh, question, but do you see that as well? This this redefinition and um, really their bizarre haphazard way of doing it, but still driving towards a new kind of hero. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to pick up specifically on the Wally West bit because I think that... So I'm not going to attribute ill motive in the same way I would the intersectionals to Jeff Johns for bringing Barry Allen back, though I do think that Flash Rebirth, n not the 2016 version, the, the 2009 miniseries, uh, was a mistake because I think that we should have kept Wally and, and kept Barry dead, um, which is seems to be how lots of comic book characters should go really in hindsight but anyway point being i don't think that that, that was ill motivated to eradicate wally i think that that was just silver age revivalism nostalgia by johns but that did create the unfortunate pigeonholing of wally as a redundant flash even though he had been the flash for nearly 30 years at that point at least 25 and with the advent of the 2014 wally that was an obvious attempt to race swap the character like there's there's no reason that he should have been changed whatsoever beyond you just wanted a, a an african-american flash um the same reason as there is no reason the batwoman needed to be a lesbian beyond the fact that dan didio wanted a lipstick lesbian batwoman and all the great art from jh williams iii in the world cannot take away from the fact that she was a tokenized character from the off right the the introduction of Wally again in 2016 Flash Rebirth was a really hopeful moment for many people because it felt like the fans were thrown a lifeline that the continuity was respected you didn't even have to eradicate Wallace West he was sidelined just by virtue of nobody really wanted to write about him except for in uh, the Teen Titans yeah because it was Titans and Teen Titans title and the fact that Wally was back meant that continuity and the the fact that the fans had paid for decades to give the people who had ruined their properties a job that was respected then what happened was with heroes in crisis in 2018 that not only killed off all the momentum momentum of rebirth but it was in, much in the way that and i don't really like nietzsche very much but in twilight of the idols nietzsche said much of philosophy is confession it betrayed how these people are very nihilistic very narcissistic are very wrapped up in their own traumas and so it contaminates well, as evil often does as c.s lewis once said um, rather than creates new things and so tom king not taylor sorry two cheeks same backside i suppose tom king decided to contaminate the character of wally west with his own trauma his own bedridden anxiety attacks his own um inability to assert an objective moral framework and make everything conditional on how he feels at the time and imbue the dc universe back again with this edgy self-indulgent misery and it created a terrible story and i think the treatment of wally west being locked in this cycle of the same thing of, of with the broad DC universe of reinvention and falling into entropy that started from Watchmen, accidentally started from Crisis and Infinite Earths and all the reboots. I think it betrays the fact that the, that the progressives genuinely have not a creative bone in their body. They don't understand real pathos. They don't understand real heroism. And unfortunately, Wally West has been a casualty to the progressive project when he was one of the great characters. And he was a great character because he earned his spot. He came up, he was a sidekick, he then inherited the mantle of Barry Allen, and much to the, the benefit of the fans, he did right by the mantle that he inherited. They The, the creative team that went it wasn't just Wade, it was, I think it was Mezzan the Lobes that picked up the original Flash in 86 when he, when he won the lottery. I could be wrong, correct me on that. Um, they took the core essence of the Flash and took it forward with the new spin of, well, I feel intimidated because I've got to live up to my Uncle Barry's example. And the fans really warmed to him because they felt in many respects that, that he was 
paralleling them. They'd grown up with the character too, and they'd grown into a new era. So that's why people loved it, because it was personalized, because it respected the buying power of the consumer that was keeping the industry afloat. Now, they actively try to propagandize the consumer, and then spit in your face, much like they did on that Zoom call with all the uh, LGBT creators, including James Tinian. And, and James Tinian, actually, this is, a, this is a great point to link it back to the dialectic. James Tinian basically articulates this dialectic, because he openly admits, yeah, there's going to be times when the pendulum swings from progressive to reactionary and back and forth. There's going to be market pressures there. There's going to be cancelled books. But all we need to do is hold our breath and wait it out. And eventually, the long arc of history will eradicate any of our opponents and we'll get to there if we just keep chipping away at it with, with transing the characters and queer washing the characters. So the progressives are very conscious of this being their project. And unfortunately for the consumers, they don't care which characters they have to step on to get ahead. And this is actually one of the great tragedies of the fact that yourself, Eric, um, uh, so many other creators have to do things like comics gay is that in order to be creative lots of people are shut out from industries one of my great dreams as a kid was always to contribute at least one of the little stories to the the collection that would end up being you know uh, superman's 100th anniversary issue but that's never going to happen because i'm never going to get hired because i'm a straight white man right so what's happened is it has allowed us to have a new wellspring of creativity brand new stories be told brand new artists can come up and 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 tell these great new heroic paragons of virtues in different settings. Fantastic stuff. But there is something irreplaceable about the nostalgia we feel for certain characters, and those almost necessarily have to fall by the wayside in the meantime because the progressives have utterly captured this institution. And so people like Wally West, characters like Wally West, because he's not real, um, that I really looked to growing up and, and really enjoyed the exploits of, they have become cannon fodder for this long arc towards justice, and it's just very sad to see. So, again, one of the things you just touched on and I find really telling is, again, that line you had from Nietzsche um, that all philosophy is self-confession. Um, these people, again, when I listen to the podcasts that specifically come out of Marvel over and over and over again, and I've said this in many of my videos, um, they talk about their mental health and how many times they have to go to the therapist. And and it's usually women because this is mostly coming out of the women of Marvel podcast or, or Marvel voices who concentrate on um, these intersectional feminists, but they talk about it as a normal thing. And I'm thinking to myself, uh, no, again, the way that you would put it, you have mates that go down, you go down to the, to the pub and have a drink and, and uh, you know, hash things out with them. You don't need to go to, to a therapist in order to solve all of your life's problems. But we, what we see is, I think, on the page, the expression of the fact, which I would say, I would guess anyways, that most of these therapists are, are just um, acknowledging their identities and, and pushing them more into this direction and say, express it more, express it in a way where you can really, what it is, is get more attention. And so they, they slap this down on the page as a mental health exercise, which is a reflection of themselves instead of a story. And that's what we get within a lot of comics right now and have for the last 10 years or so. And it is destructive, not just to comics and to individual characters, or even just to the industry, but to storytelling itself, and even the English language, I would say, to, to a base extent. But am I just projecting something onto what these books actually are? Or do you see that in a lot of this as well? No, I see that all the time. One, the butchery of the English language is most evident in, and I, I know it's one of the later issues, later 79s or 80s, it might be 76, I think, of Tom King's Batman run, where Gotham Girl is fighting Blockbuster, and the entire page is just her babbling away to herself. And not only is the dialogue written in modern vernacular with a galley girl accent, but it also breaks the form of comics because the comics panels, the, the gutter space in between is meant to denote time. It's meant to take the reader on a journey and, and you meant to fill in the gaps between the static images. But if she's having this Iliad of a soliloquy in this one static image, it, it takes you out of it entirely. So it's not just poorly written and structured on an English language level, but it is confession. Um, lots of these people, this is why you constantly hear about representation, they need to see themselves in everything because they're narcissists, but they're also deeply insecure in order to feel validated. They need to feel validated by their therapist, their author, uh, Twitter, apparently. And part of this is because of their deep insecurity. 
their consciences are screaming at them at all times. And this is this is something that I've spoken about before with, with the Pride Parades, right? This is why kink has crept into Pride. Because these people know innately in their gut that what they're doing is kind of disgusting. For If you're walking around with a, a dog collar on in broad daylight and talking and barking at children with a leather dog mask on, you know there's something deeply wrong with you. And instead of do what normal people would do, which is put up a moral wall and a prohibition and, and have some standards of propriety and put a suit on and get married and have kids and live a happy life. No, instead, you need to do, indulge in your fetishes publicly because even if you do them privately, you know you carry that around with you in your heart that every single interaction that you have with a person, you want to avoid that topic so you don't get publicly shamed. So instead, you need to create a public standard that affirms your lifestyle choices and goes to the point of celebrating it just so the crowd cheering for you and the, you um, leaning into your, your basest impulses rather than setting a good standard for yourself, that noise of the crowd cheering for you drowns out the screaming of your own conscience. And that's why these people need to vomit all of their emotions, all of their sexual preferences, all of their darkest desires, the fact that they ally with the villains more, and they need to, they need to put it on every page, imbue it with every character, because they're so deeply insecure and their parents didn't love them enough that they need validation, they need to crowdsource it from, from the viewers, from people online, and from the wider society. They want to appoint themselves as the legislators of a new morality because they know that they're so utterly mediocre that unless they change every standard, they won't be celebrated like the kind of people that they actively denigrate. So we're coming up to the end of our hour, but there is one question. There's so many things off of what you just said that I would like to continue with, but I wanted to ask you a question before you left, and um, it's fairly long. But for me, anyways... Um, I find, again, that denigration of the English language something which is the most lamentable because even within my past, I mean, we had, we had anyways, I don't think it's this way anymore, we had um, a concentration on an English style setting of education. And when I was in high school, um, our English classes centered around Shakespeare. Um, when we um, went to university, if you took English, um, a lot of it centered around Chaucer. And, you know, there was a, a leftover of before comic books, there were you know, stories for children were things like the Iliad and the Odyssey or versions of them at the very least, like uh, the Battle of the Frogs and uh, Toads or Frogs and Mice, uh, things like that. So there is within that, and I would say especially within the study of Shakespeare, even though some people find it so dry, there is a lyrical quality which is added on to the English language, which is specifically, I would say, denote it by the works of Shakespeare. Because if you go back to the Greek and the Latin, it's fairly easy with um, the way that the prefixes and suffixes work to put in that kind of lyrical quality. But when you take something like um, the, the plays of Shakespeare with the um, iambic pentameter, it just exalts English to a point where you see how lyrical and beautiful it can be. And that has been lost through education and the denigrating of these great works so that we no longer see it within even basic storytelling within the exaltation of the English language of what it can be. But if since you're sitting there in England and you have your pulse on what is going on politically, is this something you think will ever make a resurgence or is it something that is being destroyed continually? You know, the, the study of Shakespeare, the study of the classics, all that kinds of thing, which lead to a real appreciation of the lyrical quality of the English language. So it's a bit of both, um, and hopefully we can end on a hopeful note here. I'll, I'll start off with the more miserable part of that. This is a deliberate project to hollow out the education system of any ability to properly form an intellectual immune system in children because we can see i think c.s lewis put this really well in the abolition of man with the example that he used of the green book which was a school textbook written by people he pseudonymed as gaius and titius and they try to debunk everything about the idea that the world is innately imbued with qualities, whether you want to attribute it to a divine creator or some sort of undercurrent of the universe that human beings can collectively but disparately identify as a common human experience. The example they use is the beauty of a waterfall. And they say in the textbook, the the person that is observing the waterfall is described as projecting their feelings onto the waterfall rather than the waterfall innately being beautiful and soliciting in every man who looks at it a feeling of overwhelming awe, of beauty, of sublime. And so Lewis says you shouldn't disenchant the world because one, it's ridiculous to say that 
basically I have sublime feelings and project them onto all things because that makes things very nihilistic. And also, it doesn't really make sense and it doesn't line up with, with how we move about and interpret the world. But but also, by disenchanting the world, you, you ensure it so that people are not adequately armed when their civilization comes under threat to defend it. And that seems to be a deliberate thing that has been done. Um, because, of course, we, we know that there has been a counter-movement in education by the likes of Paolo Freire and Pedagogy of the Oppressed, which says that there should be no hierarchy between student and teacher. That Instead, the student and teacher should reciprocally in dialogue, in a dialectical process, the teacher should be unconditioned by the naivety of the student from the the civilizational oppression that we've been talking about that besets heroes in comics now. Um, they should have all that repealed by, by childlike questioning, and the children should, as well, be imbued with all of the Marxist rhetoric that the teacher should be learning and putting into their heads to make young, perpetual revolutionaries, people that want to tear society asunder to apparently build something really good from the ashes and it'll be real communism this time, you guys. Um, I think, actually, though, that the backlash to this that we're seeing we haven't reached peak woke, we haven't put woke away, there's going to be a whole new issue that eventually comes down the pipe and, and dwarfs the, the trans issue, for example, it's always just going to get worse. But people are beginning to slowly insulate themselves, and you can see this, especially even among the the rise among my generation, who lots of whom aren't parents yet, I'm not parents, but I know I've agreed to homeschool my kids, or at least have a have my colleagues privately tutor them, or, or at least vet the values of a school that, that I would be putting them in, that we want to give our kids the kind of education that we were in large part deprived of. You know, I, I remember Peter Hitchens was sitting on a Question Time panel quite a while ago, and he decided to recite off the top of his head some beautiful poetry, and said, isn't it a shame that the average schoolboy doesn't know this, doesn't know Ovid, doesn't know Chaucer, doesn't know some of the some of the great hymns that were written. Um, I, I find it actually really nice now. I, I, become a church-going Catholic rather than just a, a casual Catholic over the last year or so, mainly because I take my nan on Sundays, so we have a nice time. I found it really enriching to learn some of these hymns and prayers and the like off by heart, and I found it's actually expanded not only my, my sense of connection with the metaphysical and with beauty and with gratitude, but also just my intellectual capacity. And, and I think that things were better when you were able to learn and were versed in the great works of literature. I think that's also one thing that, that is a great shame that happened in the US, of taking the the Bible out of schools entirely, not because I want and expect every child to believe it, but because how are you meant to understand the great canon of, of English literature without understanding the reference points that the likes of Milton and and Mary Shelley based their work on. It's it's to deliberately deprive you of the ability to, to mount a defense of your own civilization. But the good thing about this is, the more people wake up to the fact that we were deprived of this, ed of this education, the more people wake up to the fact that we were deprived of it for deliberate reasons, the more people want to pass it on to their kids. And so, while I have an immense library of some of the greatest comics, and I urge everyone to buy physical media where, where you can as well, because otherwise they'll just eradicate it and erase it and every record will be rewritten per 1984. But not only do I have that massive library of comics to give to my son one day for pure escapism, but I do aim to build a body of work both at low seaters for the wider culture to, to debunk the debunkers, but also try and keep hard copies of some really great literature and, and understand it myself so I can sit there and discuss it with my future kids. And I think if more people did that, we'd be able to to counteract the nihilistic programming and socialist indoctrination going on in every educational institution across our various countries. Well, I wholeheartedly agree. I think that um, memorization is one of the things that has gone by the wayside, which really should be something that everyone should practice. Not only is it good for your mental health, but if you take some of these great works of poetry or philosophy or anything else and you memorize sections of them or, or psalms or things like that, you memorize them and they become part of a, a beautiful natural flow within your mind in order to describe the things that you run across. I, I find that to be uh, something that is really, really uh, helps me anyways. I, I love um, trying to memorize these older works of, of great literature. Anyways, we could go on, I think, for several hours talking. Um, there's so much there that you have said that I, I would love to discuss. I, I would have you on again if you ever want to come back. But um, before Definitely. I go, I just want to give you um, a chance to let everyone know where they can find you and uh, anything else you want to talk about, about what you're doing in the future. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you very much for having me on. And I'd obviously definitely like to come back. It's been a really nourishing conversation. You can find most of my work these days over at lotuseaters.com. I have a author 
portal on the website. It's just on the drop down menu of, of in house contributors and just click on Connor so you can get all of my latest content. We also have Comics Corner, a series that Harry and I do once a month. The most recent episode was on M. Night Shyamalan's Unbreakable Split and Glass films. The next episode I will leak exclusive to your channel will be on Berserk and we take requests from our audience at any time. So please go over and sign up for as little as £5 a month to get all of our premium content every month and you can engage with us there. If you want to reach out to me just get in touch on twitter at con underscore tomlinson and i'll often post my clips from other bits of tv i do because over the course of the last few years i've been a freelance contributor to some british tv stations like talk tv and gb news and also even occasionally to some american stations like the first tv so you'll catch all of my clips over on my socials and most of my content on lotusheaters.com well, thank you very much. And again, as I said, I would love to have you back because I have so much I want to discuss, even with what we've just talked about. So thank you once again. So if this interview has given you anything new to think about, hit like, hit the shield in the lower right hand corner of your screen to subscribe and leave me a comment. Tell me what you want to add to this conversation. And don't forget, the links are in the description, both for my two superhero graphic novels, The Valiant Heroes and Thomas Valiant, and also the link for the early bird sign-up page for Crom the Destroyer. All right, I'll leave it there. I'll see you later. Bye.